Eventually, my, my plan is to have something so that we can do kind of like that. Alright, now. My plan is to listen to it and Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. There you go. Hey, Tony, can you do me a favor and check on that and make sure that I'm in the, I'm in the frame? I can't tell if I'm in or not. Am I in the frame? Yes. Alright, perfect. I'm trying to make sure nobody else is because I know that people are a little sketchy on that. So. I'm going to check on that. No, no, I'm good because I'm black and hurt. <laughs> so you're fine, Lois, don't worry. Until Tom gets here. We don't have to worry about the counting this one. Right, right. Well, until Tom gets here. Oh, there he is. Anyway. <laughs> <laughs> you enjoy that. Oh, give me her. Give me her. Let's see which one it is. Hey, it's Judy. It's not even one of them. Come on, Judy. <laughs> Well, when I see myself on there, I think, that's not me. I don't look like that. Yeah, you do. You look just as pretty in there as you do here. Yes, you do. I know the tailor would like to see you there. Oh, does she? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. That's her grand, granddaughter. Mm -hmm. <laughs> that one. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Hi, Vicki. Come on in. Yeah. See, she was right behind her. She's right behind her. <laughs> Wait, I'll pass one out for Judy. No. Jack is coming. Okay, watch Jack. One green thing. There you go. All right. Um, just so you're aware, before we, uh, we pray, uh, two keys are there. That's the Donald Wilcox this time. And then uh, hot water, hot water, coffee, and coffee, and then regular water if you want to try try that. So we got we got those things. Covered. All right. Um, why don't we go ahead and pray, and then we'll uh, we'll introduce ourselves one more time, and then we'll we'll start. Okay. Hey, Jack. Good to see you. Nice to be here. <laughs> All right. All right. Okay. Now, for the for the sake yeah. of reading, you are Jack Senior. Yes. You're Jack Jr. Oh. <laughs> I just don't have three you're, jobs. You're, you're welcome. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right, and then, yeah, there was one time this summer we had three Jacks yeah. here. Yeah. So it was like, you know, Jack one, two, and three. And that's how we got it. Yeah. All right, well, why don't we pray? So, Father, we just thank you in Jesus' name that you've gathered us this evening safely to be here and to be in your word. Uh, Lord, we know that, that we need the wisdom of the Holy Spirit to understand and, and, to, and, to, and to act out on the word uh, that you have for us here today. So we ask, uh, Lord, that uh, as we come into the presence of Jesus, that the Holy Spirit be our teacher. And Lord, that whatever is of the flesh or of sin or temptation when the devil would fall to the ground and die would be of no effect so that we're completely available for all that you have for us now. Uh, and Lord, also, uh, before we start, we also want to pray for uh, Myrtle. She asked us to pray for her. So we just pray the healing that you purchase on Calvary's Hill uh, into her sinuses and into her body. Lord, we pray release the captive in Jesus' name. And for her to have complete healing and glorify the name of Jesus. We thank you that you purchased it. We receive it for her. And we thank you in advance in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 All right. Well, we're going to go around with Diana, right? All right. So we're going to go around and introduce ourselves, and then we'll move right on in to this. And I'll start with me. All right. My name is Rob. I'm the pastor of this place. Good to see you. And um, we'll start over here. Third Rosemary Ames. Chuck. <laughs> <laughs> That's Lois. Yeah. Jack. Uh, Judy. All right. And um, within the next few minutes, we should have Tom and Claudia too. So, but anyway, it's good to have you here. And uh, what we're what we're doing is we're we're in the last chapter 
of First Corinthians. We're doing chapter 16. And just so you know, um, we do we kind of we read it, we start looking at the notes, and then uh, we make a walk. However, the Holy Spirit leads us to kind of see where you know where where the need is or where the question is. So feel free if there, there are questions at all, just bring it out and we'll deal with it. Okay? Alright. All right, so we're in uh, First Corinthians 16, and let's uh, let's chop this up uh, in the reading part so that we'll uh, we'll look at it as a whole first, and then we'll go through the notes. So, I'll, Vicky, if it's all right, I'll start with you. All right, if you'll read uh, verses one through four. Tell me, you up to reading today? All right, well, you do uh, five through. Uh, Really, I, I'd like you to do 5 through 12, if you would. Okay. And then, uh, Terry, how about you? You all right? How about you do a 13? I'll just do 13 at the end of the chapter. Okay. All right. Now, about the collection for God's people, do what I told the Galatian churches to do. On the first day of every week, each one of you should set aside a sum of money in keeping with his income saving it up so that when I come, no collections will have to be made. Then, when I arrive, I will give letters of introduction to the men you approve and send them with your gift to Jerusalem. If it seems advisable for me to go also, they will accompany me. I will visit you after passing through Macedonia, and I intend to pass through Macedonia, and perhaps I will stay with you, or you to spend the winter, so that you may help me on my journey wherever I go, for I do not want to see you now just in passing. I hope to spend some time with you, if the Lord permits. But I will stay in Ephesus until Pentecost, for a wide door of effective work has opened to me, and there are many adversaries. When Timothy comes to see that you put him at ease among you, for he is doing the work of the Lord as am I. So let no one despise him. Help him on his way in peace, that he may return to me, for I am expecting him with the brothers. Now concerning our brother Apollos, I strongly urged him to visit you with the other brothers, but it was not at all in his will to come now, but he will come when he has opportunity. Watch ye stand fast in the faith. Quit you let quit you like men be strong. Let all your things be done with charity. I beseech you, brethren, you know the house is Stephanus, Stephanus, that it is the first fruits of Achaia, and that they have addicted themselves to the ministry of the saints, that ye submit yourselves to such and to everyone that helpeth us and labor. I am glad of the coming of Stephanus and Fortunus, and Achaeus, for that which was lacking on your part, they have supplied. For they, for they have refreshed my spirit in yours. Therefore acknowledge ye them that are such. The church of Asia salute you. Aquila and Priscilla salute you much in the Lord with the church that is in their house. All the brethren, brethren greet you Greet you one another with a holy kiss. The salutation of me, Paul, with my own hand. If any man love not the Lord Jesus Christ, let him be anathema. 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 Anathema means accursed. Mar Maranatha. Maranatha. Mar Maranatha. Which means uh, our Lord come. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. May love be with you all in Christ Jesus. Amen. All right, thank you. Thank you. All right, hey, before we go into those eight questions or comments before we start, just about what you saw or heard. Okay. All right, well, let's look at the next step. All right. So, in. Uh, 1 Corinthians 16, verses 1 through 4. 
we see instructions concerning the collection uh, for the same. And we read in Acts that there is at least one collection that was taken uh, when it came to a famine that was coming to the whole Roman world during Claudius. And so they took that collection so it was available uh, for the saints at that time. Um, but when we're talking about this collection here that's being taken, uh, it may not be specifically for that particular reason because we know that Paul and Barnabas had taken that collection earlier down and now you just have Paul with these particular uh, people. So it may not have to do anything with the family at all. Um, so let's read Romans 15, 24 and 28 to get a sense of um, what the collection is. And let's see. Ruth, he'll read that. That'd be great. <coughs> Romans chapter 15, 24 to 28. Oh, I got you. Yep, yep. <laughs> I hope to do so now. I would like to see you on my way to Spain and be helped by you to go there after I have enjoyed visiting you for a while. Right now, however, I am going to Jerusalem in the service of God's people there. For the churches in Macedonia and Achaia. Achaia, Achaia by the way, is, is, would, be, would be a province uh, or a state within the Roman Empire. Corinth was in that in that province. So that's why they're they're Achaeans. They're they're part of that. Okay. Have freely decided to give an offering to help the poor among God's people in Jerusalem. That decision was their own, but as a matter of fact, they have an obligation to help them since the Jews shared their spiritual blessings with the Gentiles. The Gentiles ought to use their material blessings to help the Jews. Okay. Through 28. Yeah, go ahead and finish that. When I have finished the, this task and have turned over to them all the money that has been raised for them, I shall leave for Spain and visit you on my way there. Okay, thank you. All right, so so what what kind of collection is this? What's it? Who's it for? So, the poor in, in particular where? Jerusalem. In Jerusalem, okay. Um, so it's not, it's not, it doesn't appear to be famine relief. It's something different. It's for the poor that are in Jerusalem. Um, so why might the saints in Jerusalem need this money? Let's look at uh, 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, 14 and 16, and um, many of you'll read that in the great. Uh, there you go, brother. Okay. Okay. Right there, First Thessalonians, chapter two. Right there. Okay. Go ahead. Go ahead. Yeah. Okay. For you, brothers, become imitators of God's churches in Judea, which are in Christ Jesus. You suffered from your own countrymen, and the same things those churches suffered from the Jews. Who killed the Lord Jesus? Who killed the Lord Jesus and the prophets, and also drove us out? They displeased God and are hostile to all men. More? One more? Yeah, one more verse. Okay. In their effort to keep us from speaking to the Gentiles, so they may be saved. In this way, they always heap up their sins to the limit. The wrath of God has come upon them at last. All right. So what, what Paul is, is saying in, in 1 Thessalonians is that there was a, a great persecution in the church. And we know that that was true uh, at, least, at least one other time 
uh, when you were looking at Jerusalem, because uh, after uh, there was a great revival and a great awakening in Jerusalem, after a time, uh, they set to kill James, and then they, they, after they had killed Stephen, and then they meant to kill off Peter too, but the angel came and mm -hmm. delivered him. And this led to a, a general persecution in that Jerusalem area that caused the church to flee out of Jerusalem. Some stayed. We find in Acts that the, the apostles stayed in Jerusalem, and there were churches that stayed in Jerusalem. But by and large, there was an exodus. And that exodus was actually God-ordained because that caused the church to go to the areas that they weren't at before, like Samaria, Cyprus, created Antioch in, in Syria, and other places. So what sometimes what that means is that you know when we see persecution happening and we see bad things happening, we, we, we tend to think, wow, that's horrible, and the devil might be at work. Well, the devil might be at work. But in the end, God is also at work. Mm -hmm. And many times what what human beings and the devil mean for evil, God intends for good, and he's actually using it to forward his purposes. Remember that Jesus said in Acts 1, he said to the disciples, look, you stay here in Jerusalem until you receive the power from on high, and I will make you witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to all the ends of the earth. Well, all right, so Pentecost came, they were in Jerusalem, they were having a great time there. It was awesome. And they had a few congregations out in the hinterland. But as a whole, they were right there in Jerusalem having a great time. And they weren't moving. And they weren't moving to the Gentiles. And so what, what happened was this persecution came and forced them to get out of Jerusalem. And where did they go? Well, Philip went to Samaria. And then there was a awakening there and people came to faith. Uh, you had Cornelius getting saved with his household. The Romans were getting saved. And then, of course, you had Paul, who decided to follow these Christians where he could, and then he got converted, and then we know the rest of that story, where that missionary went all over the place after he was in Antioch. Of course, Antioch was established by Jews who had fled, Jewish Christians who had fled to Cyprus, and then from Cyprus, they went into Antioch. So that, many times when we see something going on, and it looks hurtful and painful, and it is hurtful and painful, we need to remember that that, that does not mean that God is not in it, and it does not mean that God's plan is not working. Actually, it may be exactly what God needs to do to move things forward. And it may, it, we, may, we may say, well, okay, couldn't he have done it easier? Maybe so. But i got to tell you that uh, just from, from experience, my own experience, there are times, and, and just kind of look at your own life, when you're settled and you're feeling good and you're satisfied, and then you're not growing or you're not moving. And a lot of times what gets, your, what gets your attention is not something positive, it's something negative. And it moves you, it moves you forward. And I guess, you know, one of the, one of the things that, that, I, that I think about is, is that, you know, as a, as a guy, and I'm not trying to pick up the guys here, but you know, the one thing that my, my wife kept telling me over and over again was, you need to go get a physical. You need to go get a physical. Yep, I'll get it. I feel fine. Well, the point of a physical is that, you know, get there while you're still feeling fine so they can keep an eye on you. You know, when I go to the doctor, when well, I don't feel fine. Sometimes that's too late. And, and yeah, it gets me there. And I think what you find here is the same way. A lot of, uh, it's our human nature to just set. And we need something to get the ball rolling again. And in this case, it was these persecutions. And it is, 
it is an amazing fact of history that where churches are satisfied, I mean, when, when everything's going fine, the culture seems to be with them, and everything's nice and calm, that's when the churches disintegrate. Because they're not moving anymore, they're just sitting. John's all done. We'll just enjoy the fruits. But if you go around the world and you find the churches that are being persecuted, what's going on? There's actually an awakening and revival going on there. Because guess what? They can't look to the things of this life anymore to be satisfied. They gotta look to Jesus. And when they're focused on him, that's when things start to move. By the way, that's why they, uh, it was interesting because I was listening to uh, an account from Al Jazeera, believe it or not. I don't listen to Al Jazeera, but if I were, I'd listen to this one Muslim guy. And, and he, 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 he made this, this proclamation that he, I don't think he realized what he was saying. Because he said they have a problem. Because the more they try to de destroy the church in Iran, the more converts are turning to Christ. There's a there's a there's an underground church in Iran that's got over an estimated over five hundred thousand wow. former Muslims who are who are believers, and many of them used to persecute Christians, but then they saw the grace that God was doing there, and then they met the Lord themselves and got saved. So sometimes it looks horrible, and 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 by the way. I'm not asking them to change places with any one of them. Because I don't want to be crucified. And I don't want my head chopped off. And I don't want to get hung. But let me tell you something. We look at that and we see the horror of it. But at the same time, even though the devil means it for evil, God is using it for good. And that, by the way, that's a simple principle that you find throughout the scripture. Wherever someone means it for evil, God is always using it for somebody's good. Just like Joseph. Remember Joseph? And he had a vision from God that he was going to rule his brothers. And then as a teenager, he had the not too good sense to let his brothers know just how high and, and exalted he was going to be. And so they hated him. Even his father said, yeah, you know, you need to be quiet. <laughs> you do. Joseph was a teenager. They didn't know enough to be quiet. And I imagine that he thought, hey, I'm going to be high and exalted. You're going to bow to me. Little did he know that the way to that exaltation was to get thrown into a pit after he beaten up by his brothers, sold into slavery. Falsely accused him of, of, of rape. Didn't be in prison for a couple of years. And then come to Pharaoh uh, with, you know, to interpret a dream. And, and, then, and then he gets put in a place where he can save his people. And save others. But what happened to him was that even though the devil... See, when God has a plan for your life, the devil has a plan to mess it up. He does. And so you start walking, he's going to start trying to trip you up. And he tries to try to discourage you. And cause you to just give up on the vision. And yet, one thing about Joseph was he never gave up on the vision. But he could change. So that when he finally met his brothers, he realized what he was there for. He wasn't exalted for his own sake. God decided to put him in this place for his calling to save his brothers, to save Israel, to forward the purpose of God in regards to the coming of the Messiah, and to save the lives of men and Gentiles as well, because God loves the whole of humanity. So through his trials, he was humble, but he never lost his faith. And that's something that we all need to remember as well. Sometimes we'll be humble. Sometimes the enemy will come in to try to discourage us, but we'll hold on. The vision will come out. 
although it may come out different than what we're thinking it should come out. But it will serve God's purpose. That's that's that in a nutshell. <coughs> Any questions, comments about that? <coughs> All right, let's move on here. And what so what's going on then with these things? It's very much what goes on actually nowadays uh, in in the Christian world right now, and that is if you are a Christian, you are not popular. Uh, I was listening to a, I was listening to a, a gal on a Christian radio, and she was talking about how when her she and her family came to faith in a Muslim nation. Okay. Well. They're, they're called divinity, which means that they're 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 of no count. They get taxed extra heavy. Their her father is just trying to it, it, it work at least two jobs just so that they can eat. All right. Is in, in, in most of the world being a Christian has a cost attached to it. All right, there's a cost to it. And so what this collection is about is just a reminder that as the whole church, we're connected to each other. And we have an obligation to help our brothers and sisters who are paying the cost in a way that we're not so that they don't despair. So these other churches... Where while they're meeting persecution, they're not meeting the same kind of persecution that's going on in Jerusalem. They agree we're going to send money down there so that our brothers and sisters have something to eat. It's and by the way, you know any church that that, that does mission work or any any congregation that does that, that's what we're doing. When 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 we're giving to like the Nicaragua uh, mission. Or we're giving to um, Rome, not Rome, um, the, the Cameroon Deaf School, where they're teaching the evangelism to the to the deaf. Uh, when we're doing these things, you know, not everyone can be a missionary, but we can, through the blessing that God's given us, extend that help to these people who don't have, so that they can have something. To lift them out of despair. So, any that that's why we do mission work outside, so that they can they can not despair. It's very much like what's going on right here in First Corinthians 16. We're helping to bear each other's burdens that way. All right. That's what's going on in this collection. Right. You have something to talk. I guess all I'd say is uh, when we do that too, then it, it isn't the intent, but we sure receive a lot of perks when we do that. I mean, the Lord blesses us. Yeah. You know, when when we share with our bounty with those in need. Yeah. And it just happens. No, know? but but you know, Jesus said it's more blessed to give than to receive. And and, and once you start giving, you realize how true that is. Mm -hmm. It is more blessed to give. Than to receive. By the way, I love to receive from the Lord, but I, I, I love what happens when you give. Yeah. God, that's awesome. Yeah. Amen. Yeah. All right. And by the way, giving doesn't have to be financial all the time. You know, praying for somebody is giving. But this is dealing with the finances of that. So that's what that was about. All right. So how are they to collect this money? Um, yeah, did you read? Yeah. Okay. So, Peggy, hey, will you read um, 1 through 4 again for us? Yeah. yeah. Now concerning the collection for the saints, as I have given orders to the churches of Galatia, so you must do also. On the first day of the week, let each one of you lay something aside, storing up as he may prosper, that there be no collections when I come. And when I come, whomever you approve by your letters, I will send to bear your gift to Jerusalem. 
but if it is fitting that I go also, they will go with me. Okay. So, uh, how are they to collect this money? What do you see there? On the first day of the week. Yeah, on the first day of the week, they were supposed to do what? Lay something aside. Okay. And then, uh, was it was it was it uh, a set amount? Everybody owes a hundred dollars or gives a hundred dollars, or was it something else? It's as you prosper. So, in other words, here you have you, you have a principle uh, that Paul mentions earlier on, and that is that the Lord loves a cheerful giver, and you give according to what you have, not according to what you have not. So, in, in other words, um, if you're a millionaire then you would give according to whatever God puts in your heart. You obviously could, could perhaps give more than, say, someone who, who's working at the dock. So what you do is, you know, whatever the Lord puts on your heart, that's what you give. But don't worry about, it's not about the amount, it's about whatever God puts on your heart. Do it. Okay, and then they, they would just collect that up and use that. There wasn't, there wasn't a, uh, okay, there, there, there's, there are 100 members in this congregation, so everybody gives $10. That wasn't how it worked. This was, this was different, okay? Um, so what, what does it say to us that they collected this money on the first day of the week? Well, what's the significance of the first day of the week? What is it? It's Sunday, and it's the first day of the week when Jesus was raised, was raised from the dead. Okay? So, what this is saying is that even at this very early period, Christians would meet on Sunday, on the first day of the week, because they're there to worship because Jesus was raised from the dead on the first day of the week. The reason I'm bringing this out is because I know that, that I have run uh, into people who will say that, well, it was under Constantine that churches began to, to, to worship on Sunday. But that's really not what the Bible says. And the other thing is that we find that about 100 years before Constantine, or more actually, you have a guy named Justin Martyr, who was a, a teacher in the church. And he wrote a letter to the Senate trying to defend Christianity from the persecution that it was often getting. And he wrote in his letter that what they already knew, that Christians were worshiping on the first day of the week. And that was why, because Jesus rose from the dead on the first day of the week. So it's something that had been going on from the very beginning. Now, does that mean that was the only time they were worshiping? No. Were they going to the synagogue on Saturday? You were a Jewish Christian? Yes, you were. Were they worshiping on other days? Yes, they were. Uh, it wasn't only on that day, but it seems like here in 1 Corinthians 16, the, the primary day of worship where they would gather and gather that money together was the first day of the week. So by this time, which would have been just Make sure that I did right. No, no more than thirty years after the resurrection, you have Christians meeting regularly on a Sunday. And somebody, and I, I want to say this too, because I, I've heard people say, "Well, Sunday is a, is a pagan name; it's the day of the sun." And that's true. It is. That's an accident of the calendar. Because even though the Roman calendar had it as the day of the sun, it just happened to be the same day as the Hebrew calendar that says day one. And in the Hebrew calendar, that's how they, that's how they, 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 they do their calendar. Day one, day, uh, Shabbat, and then day one, day two, day three, day four, day five, day six, Shabbat, day one. That's their calendar. Okay. 
But when you're living in a pagan world, that same calendar, because by the way, was uh, one of the things that really shows uh, God's design, even in the, in the calendar and in the dating, is it doesn't matter what culture you go to, every one of them has a seven-day calendar. And there's no reason for that astronomically. They just have it. Why? Because that's that part of God's uh, knowing God in the universe that you didn't need the Bible for. That's something that, that was already in the human heart that God has put there. A seven day week. All right. Why? Because God created the world in six days and on the seventh day he rested. Every culture knows that. There's a book that I read that said uh, what you cannot not know. And it's saying that there are a lot of things in, in nature that you, you, we suppress the truth, like it says in Romans. But if you're suppressing it, then you know it's already there. You're just pressing it down. And this is something that every culture knows. That God created the world in six days. And on the seventh, he rested a seven-day calendar. Chinese had it. Japanese had it. The Romans had it. The American Indians had it. Everybody has it. It's a sign that God created the world in six days. And on the seventh day he rested. So that's why it doesn't matter that the Romans call it the day of the sun. And some other culture called it something else. What matters is that God chose to raise up his son on the first day of the week. And that's why they were worshiping at that time. Okay? It's an accident of naming the calendar, but that, that the first day also was the day of the sun. Okay? But it wasn't the church saying, hey, let's just go to the day of the sun and we'll, we'll call it the son of God. No, that's not how it works. All right? So they're meeting on Sunday, that first day of the week. That's when they're worshiping together as a whole. And this is when they're bringing the collection. Okay? And everybody brings what God has put on their heart. And then they store it. Okay? All right. Um, what does it mean as one may prosper? Well, we kind of talked about that mm -hmm. already. But I think probably the thing to remember that Paul is saying, because he said this about the gifts of the Spirit too, don't judge what you're doing based on somebody else. Don't do it. Don't judge your gift or your availability based on what somebody else has. All right? If somebody else is working in the gifts of healing and you're working in another gift, great. Don't do that. Don't be jealous of each other. Work together because we all have to work together in that. All right? It's the same with giving. All right? You may be able, God may put it on your heart to give $200. Maybe God may put it on your heart to give a quarter. Give whatever's on your heart. See, here's the thing. Somebody taught me this a while ago. Uh, actually, been, uh, yeah, 10 years ago. Um, and it just shocked me because I hadn't really thought of it this way. But see, there was a... Um, his mom had just gotten saved. And she was so excited about her salvation. And she found out that this church needed a van, right? And so they, they, they said at the, um, at the announcement, say, you know, such and such a church needs a van. Uh, it's going to cost about $3,000. So if you can give to that, that'd be great. She really had a check for $3,000 right there. Raised her hand and said, I'm going to do that. And then she wrote it out and, and handed it over. And without ever asking God what he wanted, just, I'm going to do it. All right? 
which means don't just do things out of excitement. Weigh it with God. Find out what he wants. Okay. And what she learned later on, because the Lord rebuked her, their spirit, was that, you know, it was okay to give part of that, but when she said, I'm going to give 3000 she really was not allowing other people to give. And so we need to be mindful of that too. What does God want us to give? Because he may have somebody else in mind to give this gift and this one to give that gift. So that's what he's saying. Be led by the Spirit. Make room for other people that might want to give. Don't make it all about you. And also, be led by the Spirit about what it is that he wants you to give. You know, it's not a formula. You know, and that's why, too, you know, whenever, by the way, if anybody ever says to you, I'm looking for ten people. The Lord told me to give, uh, that, 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 that there are ten people to give, give me $500. <laughs> you know what that's called? That's called putting pressure on people. <laughs> if the Lord ever says to you, you know, there are ten people here to give five hundred dollars. That's fine. And then keep your mouth shut and see what comes in and see if it's really of God. But nevertheless, you know, it's not about pressure. You give whatever the Lord puts on your heart. Don't let anybody pressure you into it because God has this. All right. I know for me it's kind of embarrassing because one time it was, it was, um, I knew I was supposed to give. And, and that was what God said to me, for it. For it. For it. Yeah. I was embarrassed. I was like, all right, it's almost like. <laughs> Look over there. <laughs> but here's the thing. You know what? You know why he said that to me? To humble me. To humble me. To see if I'll do the hard thing. Alright? Because it's real easy for me to just write that check. Nope. It's not about you. Four is good. Thank you. We we gotta be open to that. That he will lead us in the, in the giving. So that's what he's saying. As God prospers you, don't worry about what other people are doing. It's between you and God what he wants you to give, and then you give it. That makes sense, everybody. But that's what he's really saying. Okay. Anything, any questions? Comments? Okay. Alright, so here's another thing. He, he doesn't want them collecting while he's there. Okay, he wants it all taken care of before he shows up. Why do you think what why do you think that's important? What does that what does that signify? That's it. Yep. He's not showing up and, and, and it's not about giving to him. It's about giving for the need. Again, no pressure. That's the thing. It's not about pressure. It's about being led by the Spirit. I said this way. I throw away a lot of influence. Yep. Well, and the thing is that he doesn't want to be about manipulation. That's what it seems like. Yeah, yeah, and sometimes, you know, I, I, one thing that, that, that I, I, I don't like is the way sometimes people do that. You know, they, they'll, they'll manipulate the offering. Uh, especially if they throw a prime kid on the, on the screen. You ever seen that? You know, you got this initiated figure and, oh, give, give for the children. By the way, yeah, I, I won't give to the children. But, really? 
why, why don't you just tell me what's going on? Let's pray about it. And we'll give, as opposed to manipulate my emotions. You know, that's it's a problem. It's a problem. And I found, uh, I found, look, the, the Lord will provide for, his, for, for the need. We just need to be listening and then being led wherever he wants us to go with that. He'll provide for that. And sometimes it won't even be money. I mean, this is, this, this, this is one thing that I remember that um, it really blessed me. Uh, when we were in prayer on Tuesday, about two years ago now, and you, as you come through this front door, you'll see there's a new roof that's slanted, praise the Lord. Because it was two roofs that were flat and leaking all the time. And we knew that we were going to take care of that. And we knew that it was going to be $40,000 or more. And, and I was like, wow. So I'm praying. And we're, we're praying. We're praying for the need. And, and I am praying the way I know how because I, I saw God work this way before. I'm asking for a check. <laughs> I am. I'm praying for checks, right? And um, nothing's coming yet. Nothing's coming yet. I'm still praying for checks. And we still got late. So one day we're praying in there and um, a contractor comes in, which I didn't see until after we were done praying. He comes in, and he's looking for a, a ladder so he can go up and look at the flat roofs. And um, couldn't find the ladder, so he came in here. And this, this, is his, this is his testimony. He said, I'm not a religious man. He said, I walked in here looking for somebody to tell me where the ladder was. And I saw they were praying up front. He said, so I sat down with you waiting for them to open their eyes so that I can ask them. He said, and I realized that while I was there, while I was sitting waiting, I realized there's somebody else in this place. And when we opened up our eyes, he had a smile that was huge because he had met the Lord. Hmm. And then he, he uh, Jim Berger, he, because I asked him, I said, well, can we help you? And, and he, for a full two seconds, he was like, oh, um, yeah, I need a ladder. <laughs> and and I, we told him where the ladder was, and I said, come, and, and one of them, uh, Aletha, I think, asked, can we pray for you? And, and okay, so we prayed for him. He walked out of here. He, he said these words, he said, I have to come back here. I didn't really understand what was going on. But he told Jim, uh, he looked at the four roofs, and then he, he patched them up. And the church paid zero dollars for that. And he said the reason for that is that when he met the Lord, he just gave the work to God. So we still need the roof. But we got a bit of a reprieve. Mm -hmm. And he came back and played with that roof another two, three times and never charged us. Because that's how God chose to answer. Mm -hmm. You know, at that time. Mm -hmm. So we gotta be open. Open to that. And really, when I think about it, how cool is that? Because <laughs> it's not a check. And God just decides, you know what? I'm gonna save him. And then he's going to do this for me. It's a win-win. Mm -hmm. Everybody wins. Praise the Lord. Yeah. Praise God. Amen. Yeah, praise God. Hmm. All right, so let's look at now. When the money is dispersed, three things are to be done. All right? They're the same men that they, the congregation, of credit. Um... And why, why is that important? Trust them. What's that? Trust them. Trust them. They're trustworthy. Make, you know, make, make sure these people aren't, aren't uh, filching the money. You know, 
make sure you're not going to charge a 10% handling fee. All right. This money goes all to the mission that they have in mind. All right. It doesn't go back into their pockets. And then you have uh, send a letter with the men and the gift. What does the letter signify? What's that? Commitment. It's a commitment. And also what it does is it, what you have here then is, they're, 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 again, they're following Old Testament biblical commands. They're sending witnesses and a letter that will confirm that this really is the gift that's for you. Plus the letter would have the amount that was there. So we're going to make sure, we're going to count it. Make sure it's all there. Okay? They want them to count to make sure it's all there. You know why? Because we believe that you love the Lord. We also believe that you still have a sin nature in you. And so we're going to make sure that everybody is accountable. Okay? And then finally, if necessary, Paul will accompany them. And he, again, is a, is a witness to what's going on and a supervisor. So what does it say about how the Word of God wants us to work with money in this life? Well, the first thing that comes to my mind is integrity. He wants us to have integrity in our finances. Everything will be above board and everything to go where it was intended to go. All right. You're not to fool around with it. But um, let's consider also what he wants us to do with, with that money with regards to others in our family. If you want to look at, um, Peggy, did you read yet? Okay, so Diane, do you want to read? No? Okay, how about you, April? If you'll read Ephesians 4, 28, and then Rosemary, if you'll read 1 Timothy 5, 8. We're going to Ephesians 4.28 to begin with. He who has been stealing must steal no longer, but must work, doing something useful with his own hands, that he may have something to share with those in need. Okay. So, we have two things going on there. First, if you're a thief, you need to stop stealing. That's good. Mm -hmm. Right? But what do you see? What, what's, what's the purpose of the work then? What, what he's supposed to work with his hands? He's supposed to actually do something with his life. What, what's the purpose of that, that, that making money? Yeah, something to give to him who has need. Right. Okay. So, in other words, uh, I want you to work so that having met the need that you have, you have enough to meet somebody else's need. All right. So what we find here is work is not about making money and therefore acquiring your own wealth and, and acquiring things. It's not, it's not about you know, setting yourself up at the Bahamas somewhere. That's not what it's about. It's about meeting the need that you have and also having enough to share with somebody else that you need. Okay. Well, the reason the reason that's important for us to see is because we we live in a culture where I think we still value hard work, more or less. We used to value it a little more than we do now, but um, but we have we, we've really kind of missed the mark about what work is for. Because when we think about our careers, we're thinking about self fulfillment or we're thinking about advancing ourselves uh, and advancing our, our, our financial uh, balance sheet so that we can have comfort. And God's not against you meeting the needs for your family. But having met that need, when you have more, we need to think about other people. And it really is about sharing with those who are in need. Now, that doesn't mean, by the way, because I know that, that I, I, there are some people that are concerned about this. 
Um, when it talks about the welfare of people uh, who are in need, it's talking about people who cannot work. It's not talking about people who do not want to work. It's talking about people who cannot work. If you have people like, for example, who are at the temple gates, they're, they're begging for money because they can't work. That is their job. We give to, to the poor. We talk about the widow, the orphan that can't work. We give to them. But if you're talking about somebody that can't work, but I'd rather not. That's not what this is talking about. They're actually in the same place as the thief who's being told, you know what? Stop. Get work. So that you have something to share. The Bible has zero good to say about laziness. Nothing good to say about it. It's also, by the way, not talking about socialism. And the reason I'm saying that socialism is about uh, is about basically the government <coughs> determining how that welfare is going to go. So you're basically forced to give whether you want to or not. And you're, you know, I mean, I, I, I get it where people want to give and help people. And that's certainly, the Bible has that in mind too. But what the Bible has in mind is that as the church, your giving is out of the joy of the Lord, not out of some compulsion from some uh, higher group saying you must give whether you want to or not, just to take it from you and give it to somebody. It's actually joyful giving. Like, in, for example, in, in Acts, when it says that those who had lands sold them and gave them to the apostles, and it was distributed so that anyone who had need, that need was met. Well, that's not socialism. You know what it is? It's people who were rich in material things, and they met the Lord. And they were so grateful for what God had done, and they're saying, hey, you know what? We're not, we, 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 can't, we, we, we can't possibly use all of this. And our life isn't here, in, here on earth anyway. It's in heaven. So by all means, here, distribute to those who are in need. It's willingly giving of yourself. And that's really, the thing that we need to remember is that God, when it says God loves a cheerful giver, God is also someone who never compels us to love him. Because compelled love is not love. He wants us to freely give ourselves to Him. That's why when we're talking about giving, whatever it is, He wants that to be freely done. And, and when we do give, however we give, we're becoming more like Jesus because God is a giver. He's not a taker. He's a giver. He forgives sin, He gave His Son, He shed, he shed His blood, gave His life for us, He's, a, he's continually giving, pouring out the Holy Spirit. And that's ultimately what he's trying to create in us, is the image of Jesus, where we're giving in love because we care about people. We care about what their salvation. We care about what their needs are. So it's not about compulsion. Okay, it's not about compulsion. It's about love. God has loved me and I just want to love people back the same way that he's loved me. And you can't, you can't force that. All right. All right, let's look at 1 Timothy 5, 8. Go ahead. If anyone does not, not provide for his relatives and especially for his immediate family, he has denied the faith is, and is worse than an unbeliever. Okay. So, what what's being said there about meeting the needs of your family? Is that holy? Yeah. That's holy. Meeting the needs of your family is a holy duty. God wants you to meet their needs, and He wants you to provide for their needs. What that means then, for example, is that when God is is calling for us to share with others, He's not saying 
I want your I want your child to go without food. And he's not saying that. He's going to meet the need of your family, and then what's extra goes out. Okay. And by the way, you know, it, it's, it's okay to say that, and, I, and I, I'm, always, I'm not trying to be harsh, but I, but I know that there are some young men uh, who have fathered a lot of children. And, uh, and, and I, I mean, I realize that, you know, it's, it's not rape, so the women have some responsibility in that, too. But as, as, as the people who are supposed to be the leaders in their families, and the supporters of their families. Some of these young men need to be reminded that's your first obligation. If you want to follow God, take care of your family. Take care of them. Help them. Not just financially, either, but they need to step up to the point. It's a holy call. Family is holy. You know, one of the things I would share with confirmation kids was say, you know, the fact that, that in the Ten Commandments, you have God saying, honor your father and your mother. You shall not commit adultery. Both of those are direct protections with regards to family and marriage. It matters that much to him. That this, this be understood as a holy calling and something that he considers holy and worth protecting. That's important. That doesn't change in the New Testament. All right. Anything else before we move on? No? All right, Jack, will you read uh, verses 5 through 12 again? First, uh, <coughs> Corinthians 16. I will visit you after passing through Macedonia, for I intend to pass through Macedonia, and perhaps I will stay with you or even spend the winter, so that you may speed me on my journey wherever I go. For I do not want to see now just in passing. I hope to spend some time with you if the Lord permits. But I will stay in Ephesus until Pentecost, for a wide door for effective work has opened for me. And there are many adversaries. When Timothy comes, see that you put him at ease among you, for he is doing the work of the Lord as I am. So let no one despise him, speed him on his way in peace, that he may return to me, for I am expecting him with the brethren. As for Brother Apollos, I strongly urge him to visit you with the other brethren. But it was not at all his will to come now, he will come when he has opportunity. All right, thank you. So in this in this section of 16, we're being told a, a couple of things. First of all, Paul is writing from Ephesus, so we're being told where where he's writing from. Okay, he's in Ephesus, which is in what well, used to be called Asia Minor, but Turkey now. Okay, so he's writing from from Turkey, and. Um, he plans to stay there for the present because there's a, a wide door for ministry. And he also said there are many adversaries. Now notice that the wide door for effective ministry comes also with adversaries. We talked a little bit about that earlier. It's a reminder that when God is doing something, the enemy is going to stir things up too. Always keep that in mind. Um, you know, Jesus is born. He's in Bethlehem, and then Herod comes to destroy the two-year-olds that are in that area. Wherever God moves, the devil tries to come and undermine or destroy and seek to stop what God is doing. Now, he can't stop what God is doing, but he can make a mess along the way. Let me just ask you uh, this question. When do you see this happening in your own life? Or have you seen this happen in your own life? You know, you're, you're, there's, a, there's a time when you see God working and there's great victory and it's wonderful and 
And then all of a sudden something comes and it's like cold water just gets thrown on the fire. Anybody have that happen? Happens. You know why God puts this in the, in the Bible? So that you know, one, that you're not alone. And two, that you know that in the end, he works all things together for good. It does work out in the end, according to his plan, not the devil's plan. But there is one, there is one condition. And Paul reminds us of it earlier on in 1 Corinthians, and it's this, we need to endure. We need to be patient. And somebody asked uh, a, a, a Bible teacher once, what was the secret of enduring? And you know what he said? Endure. <laughs> <laughs> that's it, that's it. You know, it's not, there, there, there's no magic bullet on this. You just keep pressing into God and endure. Trust Him. Trust Him. I think, Pastor, yep. uh, you talked about this too here, but uh, uh, just my own personal experience too, but about every time I, I had. Uh, some progress, so to speak, in my faith. You can pretty well expect I'm going to get slapped down, you know, mm -hmm. time or two or three within a short time after after this has happened. And I think it's pretty common with most people. But anyway, I was talking with Pastor Michael today, and he works with the people with addictions, the different addictions, that sort of thing. And I think you talked about this too recently, Pastor, but he said that uh, one of the people in their group when they get together once a week. Uh, Judy, you're there with the group too. But he, this one person said that after he'd given his life to Christ, uh, he had an experience, a supernatural experience. He was in bed, laying in bed, and he felt like a hand came upon his chest and just held him there, you know, for a half hour or something like that. Uh, when he was there, and he was in the group here, and pretty soon, uh, several of that group said the same thing. It happened to them. They never talked about it, but this had happened to them, you know. And it was kind of a message from Satan: "I'm not true with you," you know. And it was a, an experience where these people and their addictions really thought, "Well, now that I'm a, a Christian, I." Easy going ahead, I got it made now, and boom, here they are when this message from the evil one mm -hmm. is upon him. So. Well, and then, and then there, there are two things to remember about that. One is they need to remember something that uh, the writer of Amazing Grace said, which I love. He wrote, I am not the man I want to be. I am not the man I will be. But I thank God that by the grace of God, I am not the man I used to be. Mm -hmm. They need to remember that their, their salvation experience is real, and it means everything. So that when they feel that, that oppression and say, yeah, you know, uh, you, can't, you can't do it. You can't make it. It's not going not gonna to work. They, they need to know that he who is in them is greater than he who is in the world. They will overcome. It's going to be a battle, but the battle's already won in Christ. They just need to press in. The second thing that they need to remember is that the devil's a liar. He's a liar. By the way, that's probably the hardest thing for us to get into ourselves because we, we, we've been We've been believing his lies for so long. Mm -hmm. That is almost a habit. That as soon as he says something, we, we, we immediately agree with him and not with what God said. Because we've been defeated for so long. I know, because that was me. But once, once you get in the word and you stay there and ignore it, 
God's word becomes preeminent and that you can tell when the lie is coming. And that lie will start to lose its power. So they need to stand fast in that and realize he's a liar. They will have the victory they over have, this. Yeah, it's, it's done. They just need to remember who the liar is and it's right. not God. And by faith, act on it. See, and that's, and that's the other thing. You know, there's, there's, I, you'll find in the Bible that God makes, uh, there's like, I think somebody wrote, once wrote, there are like 8,000 promises that God has in the Bible. Some are for right now, some are for heaven, some are for the creation that's coming. But the one thing that we do find is that those promises are by and large conditional. And what that means is that is that they're they're all there and they're all available, but we need to actually press in and faith and receive it. And and, and I, I have learned that pressing in and faith, what the, the one problem that a lot of people have is that they, they look at faith as or they, they judge their faith by how they feel. And they try to work themselves up in the faith. So they feel real good. This is going to work. And and let me tell you, that's not faith. It's not. I mean you might feel good, but that's not faith. What? Yes. Good works. Well, the good works are, are, I'm coming to that because that's part of it right there. I struggled with that. Yep. And it did look like a cop off. Yeah, but see, the thing is that, that real faith will step out and do what God promises. Okay? It's not the problem with good works, and this is where, <laughs> as, as you know, in, in the Lutheran tra tradition that we're part of, where we get hung up is we hear good works and we immediately think somebody's trying to get themselves sick that way. And that's not really always the case. But when someone is, is, is acting in faith, there will be the good works associated with it because faith is always associated with acting out on what you believe. So for example, when, when um, well, I give, I, I'll give you an example uh, that was in my life when when it says everyone who calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved, delivered I remember that I was an addict by the way I don't say I'm a former addict, I'm not an addict at all because that's no longer who I am that guy's dead but when I was an addict and I came to the altar there are lots of times I came nothing but I finally did what the Bible actually said. It was very simple. I actually called on the name of Jesus. Mm -hmm. Everyone who calls on the name of the Lord shall be delivered. And so I cried out to Jesus, I, I, I can't do this. I can't. I've done everything I know how to do religiously and I can't get it done. And that's when he showed up. And that's when I was delivered of demons, and that's when I got filled with the Holy Spirit, and that's when, when things changed for me dramatically. But it was stepping out in faith and actually doing what he says. There's some people, when they're in depression, right? It says in Isaiah 61 that he has given them a garment of praise instead of a spirit of heaviness. Well, what that means is that one way out of that depression is to start praising him. Don't wait till you feel like praising him. Start praising him now. Because he said it. It's a garment of praise. I'm giving it to you. Act like you have it. And so they start praising. Even though they don't feel like it. You know what happens in about a half hour? They're doing it like they mean it. And actually the depression is starting to go away. So there are a lot of things in the Bible where, where if we would actually do what he says, that's walking in faith, we would start to see the results. And it may happen in a minute, 
two minutes, an hour, and yes, sometimes it takes years. But as we walk out that faith, God will be faithful. But you know, again, you know, like for for us, the pro the problem with some sometimes the, the the problem that I had in the Luther tradition when it came to faith was that I didn't want to connect it to works. I kept it about believing certain doctrines. And that's fine. I mean, doctrines aren't unimportant. But if you're not living them out, how, how effective are they? You see what I'm saying? So there is a connection with good works and faith that that that, that, that go hand in hand that don't that don't deny that we're not saved by our works. We're saved by faith. And yet our faith will always produce the works. Because we're going to do what God says. Does that make sense? It's not a cop out. The word covenant is in my mind right now because when you have an agreement, it takes two people, right? Yeah, right. And so when God put a new covenant in our heart, we have to do our part too. Yeah. He does his. It's all done. He's right. provided us all we need. We just need to... Just continue. walk it out. Just walk it out. Walk it out. And it's already... And the good news <laughs> is, the good news is that, that it, it, it's not how perfect we walk it out. Just stepping out of faith. And he'll do the correcting as we need to be corrected. It was one step along the way. Yeah. And I had to be, be reminded. And there are lots of other steps that we need to make. Yeah. Yeah. But it's daily. It's, it's a daily one. It's, it's a daily Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Amen. Anything else? Okay. All right, so we've seen that Paul wants to spend time with the Corinthians, uh, even perhaps spend the winter with them. Why, why do you think that is? I mean, he just got done in this letter basically shooting them down every moment he could, so why does he want to hang out with them? Keep teaching them. Keep teaching them. See, here's the thing. He he has he has the heart of a pastor. He's not willing to just and be done with them. He wants to to, to be useful to them to help grow them in the maturity he was talking about, as the Holy Spirit leads him. That's the other thing that, that I think this is important for us to realize is that you don't give up on people. <coughs> you don't give up on people. You know, and some people, it may look like it's very easy to give up on them because they're not looking for God. Uh, they're being rebellious, and some of them don't even want to know God at all. You don't stop praying for them. You don't. You don't stop teaching. You don't stop sharing. You don't stop loving. He would also say you don't compromise your faith either. You stand in truth, but you keep on. Doing, you're welcome because there will be a harvest if we don't give up. He doesn't want to give up on these people. And we see here uh, that Paul has a real shepherd's heart for the people of Corinth, and we see that there are a variety of ways he keeps those churches in the loop of ministry and, and basically in the care. And that, that's in, in this apostle. Uh, Timothy is coming with brothers. Apollo was asked to go with another group of brothers. Uh, there's a constant flow of preachers, teachers, servants of Christ coming and going connected to Paul's ministry and connected to these, these congregations. Uh, the churches need to be connected continually to the apostolic ministry. Now, my question is how, how does that happen today? Does it happen?
Right here. Yes. What is that? Right here. Right here. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yep. The Bible said it. Right in worship, we're listening to the Word, and we're 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 praising the Lord. It's there. It's it's in um when we have special meetings, and we have people uh, from other other groups coming uh, to encourage the saints and and uh, and um, help edify. It, it happens when we're we're connected with other ministries around the world, and it's a reminder that that what happened there is still part of our our experience as local congregations as we're connected up with other parts of the body and edified that way. And um, yeah, it's a reminder that we need to be united to the larger body to be effective for Christ to be strengthened. Uh, remember what Paul said in 1 Corinthians 12, 12 and 31. We are all part of the body of Christ. We're individually members of it, but we're united together in a larger body. Okay? And we need each other. And so, you know, there, there's no isolating. We're all, we're all continually connected to that flow. Okay? And we have to be. We have to be or we'll die. We have to be connected to that flow. Alright? And we see this point driven home again in verses 19 through 20. Uh, we are the church together, no matter where we are, geographically. And, uh, Rosemary, did you read already? Yeah. Okay, so, Jack Senior. Carl? That's you. You're Jack Senior, right? <laughs> All right, if you'll read uh, 1 Corinthians 16, 19, and 20. Please. <clears throat> the churches of Asia send readings, Aquila and Triscott, together with the church in their house, send you hearty greetings in the Lord. All the brethren send readings. Greet one another with a holy kiss. I, Paul, write this greeting with my own hand. If anyone has no love for the Lord, that may be accursed. O our Lord, come. The grace of the Lord Jesus be with you. My love be with you. All in Christ Jesus' name. Amen. All right, thank you. So you see that you have Achilla and Prisca, the churches of Asia, and all the brothers who are with him. And Asia is, is that large area known as Turkey, or that, that, that border, the, 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 I'm sorry, the, the coastal area of Turkey was kind of known as Asia. I think Galatia was over in the middle of that area. So it was a territory within that. But you got many churches who are saluting these people in Corinth as brothers and sisters. We're all united as one. Doesn't matter the geography, doesn't matter the congregation. Our faith is together in Jesus Christ and that's what makes us brothers and sisters. All right, let's look at verses 13 through 14. What is that? Verses 13 and 14. In 1 Corinthians? 1 Corinthians 16. Please. But if there is no resurrection of the dead... Oh, no, 1 Corinthians 16. Pardon? 1 Corinthians 16. Oh, I'm sorry. Verses 13 and 14. Watch, stand fast in the faith. Be brave, be strong. Let all that you do be done with love. Okay, thank you. Now notice that they're reminded to contend for the faith. Basically that's what they're being told. Contend for the faith. Don't don't compromise with the variety of, of, of things that were causing them to consider compromising in for it. And it's a reminder that in, in the body of Christ, 
what are we called to be? Well, we're in a, in a body if we get sick, right? We get sick, don't we? Does that happen? It does. And, um, and there's something in the body called antibodies, right? And they, and they fight sickness. And so the church is called to have antibodies that will actually stand and say no to the diseases that want to come in and wreak havoc on the body and cause it to weaken and die. So when you have, for example, in court, you have people denying the resurrection of the body. Well, that's a sickness. And the antibodies or the church is stand up and say, no, this is what our Lord says. We believe in and this is the teaching we're standing by. This is our hope. Or you have people uh, in the churches that want to promote in Corinth all manner of, of uh, sexual immorality. The antibodies are to stand up and say, no, no, this is not what the godly are about, and we're going to stand in the Lord. You have those that want to undermine of the order of creation there in Corinth? No. We're not going to do that. We're going to stand. So what Paul is saying is that as the body of Christ, you are not supposed to be uh, what's the word they want that they often use? Um, you're not supposed to be um, doormats where anybody can just walk all over you and bring whatever filth they want in. You are actually supposed to stand and say, this is true, this is not true, this is God, this is not God, and if it's not God and it's not true, then we don't want it. It's not welcome here. And, and it says, do that in love. In other words, you know, we're not, we're not there to, to hate people, but we are there to say, look, you're wrong. And if you want to be in the fellowship of believers, you need to repent. You need to change. You need to turn back to God. We'll be glad to help you, but we're not going to stand with, with that over there. That's something we need to be, be cognizant of because this. remember what we said. These letters that were written, even though they're written to specific churches, were not altogether just for those churches. They were given to the whole church to read because it applies to all of us. And would you, would, you, would you agree that a lot of the issues that we read about in Corinth are going on in our churches today? It certainly is. And, and you wrote it here, for it empties the, go the gospel of its power. Yeah. That's pretty powerful. It really does. Statement. Well, uh, for an example, um, there was a, I, I remember one of the reasons, one of the reasons that uh, this congregation and Eglin left the ELCA was because they were promoting the idea one, that the Bible was not the word of God and two, that homosexual behavior was blessed it's something that we, we should be allowed and, and, and blessed and we left because one, we believe the Bible it's God's word but the second thing was that I believe that God's purpose is not to bless homosexual relationships, but to heal people and set them free. That's what we believe. And just to prove the point, after we left, God put somebody in my, in my path who had that very issue. And they waited about two years. You know, they, I met with them. They didn't want to change. They didn't want to hear about it. And I said, well, I said, I want you to remember three things. Jesus loves you. I love you. And when you're ready to change, my door's always open. A year after that, they called me and said, I'm ready. And they came in. They got prayed for, and they had to be delivered to demons. 
which came out. They were set for me. And now, they're living a, they're living a holy life. They're, they're, they're very happy living for the Lord. And living in a, in a heterosexual union of, as husband and wife and, and children. It's wonderful. Well, if we allowed for that nonsense, that, well, they're born that way and we just have to bless it, that empties the gospel of its power. Because we're telling them you're bound, you should remain bound, and, there's, and God won't free you because that's what he wants you to be. Can you imagine telling an alcoholic that? Or someone who has any kind of problem that, you know what, God wants you to remain in that body. I'm sorry, but I don't find anywhere in the Bible where Jesus ever said to somebody who came to him, you know, I wish that, that you would appreciate this bondage that God put on you and grow from it. He never said that. Instead, be healed. Be delivered. Be set free. He's a God who wants to set a prisoner free. And but if we if we allow for the nonsense, then we actually invite people to live in unbelief. And then the gospel is empty of its power. So it, it is it's a powerful word, but it's true. It's true. I've seen where uh, Look, Jesus is well able to do what he says. He's committed to it. The question often is, is the church committed to it? Are we committed to it? You know, uh, one example I'll give you is if you look at, well, look here. Look with me, if you will. Uh, Revelation chapter 3. All right. Revelation chapter 3, and I'm actually going to go with, um, I'm not going to read all of this uh, that the Lord said to Laodicea, but I'm, I'm going to uh, just start with um, 20, verse 20, okay? But I want you to know one thing. Jesus is speaking to a church. He's speaking to a church. He's speaking to a church that doesn't know that they're deaf, dumb, and blind because they've compromised so much. But this is what he says. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come to him and eat with him and he with me. All right, now let's just stop right there. What that's saying is this. With regards to Jesus, he has done all that needs to be done. On his side, everything's taken care of. 